Johan, thank you so much for joining us. I've told you uh, in person on many occasions that I really admire your work. You are one of the very leading voices in the world in synthesizing the many fields of science uh, that relate to the climate crisis and its solutions. So thank you for joining us. It's a great honor to have you. Uh, when I give slideshows on the causes and solutions of the climate crisis, I always make a point to emphasize that agriculture is a part of the crisis and we have to move towards sustainable agriculture, particularly in animal agriculture. You have been making the point that, yes, uh, fossil fuels are the single largest source of the global warming pollution, but we now, it's not just about fossil fuels. We have to move beyond uh, the conversion to renewable energy, which is beginning, but we've got a lot of work to do. Tell us why you are placing such a great emphasis on food and agriculture. Mm. Yeah, to start with, it, it's wonderful to, to join this incredibly important initiative. So I'm humbled to have the honor to, to join with you, Vice President Al Gore. So thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, we have scientific evidence today to show that the final battleground, whether we fail or succeed with the Paris Agreement of keeping global warming below 2 degrees Celsius, is no longer whether we're able to decarbonize the world's energy system, a grand challenge in its own right, but whether we're able to transform the global food system to become a net carbon sink over the next 50 years. But it has to start as an agricultural revolution now. And why is this? Well, to start with, we know that the food system is the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases if you compare different sectors in society. Roughly 17% of the global emissions originate from land use change and our uh, livestock systems around the world, and an additional 15-17% to 17 originates from deforestation and land system change when we encroach on natural ecosystems by expanding agriculture everything from, from soya to palm oil to beef production in rainforest areas. So overall, almost a third. But additional to this, we have the intensive use of fertilizers, intensive mechanized and transport systems. So, you know, the fossil fuel burning and nitrous oxide and the whole land system change makes agriculture a dominant source of, of forcing of the climate system. Added to that, is that agriculture is the single largest consumer of fresh water, the single largest cause behind loss of biodiversity, and the single largest dominant uh, cause behind, behind, behind land system change. So overall, you get things right on agriculture, you stand a good chance of getting the world back on track within a safe operating space that in turn will enable us to uh, you know, have a transition to a safe and stable climate system. Yeah, excellent points. Uh, and many people are not aware that the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that we started using over 100 years ago and is now dominant in agriculture is made from natural gas. 90% of it is natural gas. And it's like steroids uh, for crops. And uh, seven to eight pounds of plant protein are needed to make one pound of animal protein. So the growing meat intensity of diets in the world complicates this fact. We'll be originating from Brazil in a, a few hours, and I'm troubled, as many are, of the new president of Brazil's plans to accelerate the destruction of the Amazon, largely for more uh, cattle ranching in poor soils that are not productive anyway. Um, so uh, if we can transform these systems of agriculture, we can make it net negative on carbon. Uh, that's what you're saying. We can actually recarbonize the soil. Uh, I think there are two or three times as much carbon in the topsoils as in all the forests put together. How can we recarbonize the soils and do it in a way that benefits farmers as well? Mm. Yeah, to, to start with, you, you're absolutely right when, when referring to the challenges, for example, with uh, the president-elect in Brazil with Bolsonaro that, I mean, we have a broken food system. We have, um, you know, soya production cultivated by deforesting rainforest, which then is transported across the world as feed into intensive 
food uh, meat production systems which then is shipped into consumption in cities that then leads to waste which eutrophies our waterways and destroys local ecosystems and leads to emissions of nitrous oxide which is a, a fierce greenhouse gas. So we have a, a system that simply just breaks the Earth's life support systems from biomes to the climate system and we have to change this fundamentally. Now that is that's the absolute challenge. The good news is that we have, as you indicate, a lot of practical solutions here. Uh, I was together with a, a whole group of, of scholars uh, just recently published a paper led by Professor Jules Pret in the UK showing that 90, 29% 29% of, of farming systems around the world have started to transition towards different forms of sustainable intensification. And for carbon, what every farmer knows is that more carbon you have in the topsoil, the better is your water holding capacity, the less soil erosion do you have, and better microbial activity do you have to regenerate nutrients and productivity in your root zone for your crops. Which means that fundamentally there's, a, there's such an enormous win-win here that yeah. if we can transition towards practices of conservation tillage, which means abandoning plowing, because what is often forgotten is that the mechanized modern agriculture, where we turn the soil every year as a way of preparing land for, for planting, is the largest single cause behind burning of carbon from agricultural land. You expose it to water, you expose it to solar energy, which means that you oxidize your carbon and lose it back to the atmosphere. Right. Now, if you don't touch that soil and try to copy nature in terms of building organic matter and having direct zero plowing farming systems, which we have technologies to perform, you can both build carbon in the soil, have better water holding capacities and have better productivity. Why did we in the first place develop the plow? Well, it was largely because of a weed management yeah. tactics to be able to expand the area of our cultural um, crop, cropping. And, and we have today technologies to uh, avoid just jumping on the herbicide bandwagon and instead using more you know, diverse crop rotations and different management systems to reduce weed pressure. So there are pathways to transition from an agriculture that today is a carbon source to becoming a carbon sink. Yeah, I remember as a young boy learning from my father in Tennessee on our family farm how to identify the richest, most fertile soil. It was black, as he told me and showed me, and it was usually moist. But it was a long time after that yes. I learned the reason why it's black. That's the, that's the carbon. And in the American Midwest, there is a small but growing farmer-led movement to adopt the techniques that you've described. And during the recent dr climate-related droughts and uh, ill-timed uh, downpours during planting or harvesting, these farmers are actually doing better economically than those that are still using the old industrial agriculture model, which strip mines the topsoil. For every kilogram of grain grown in the Midwest, several kilograms of topsoil go out down the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico, carrying with them nutrients and fertilizers that actually are responsible for these dead zones. So uh, this is a, a very big challenge and how do you talk to farmers who are skeptical about making this transition? Have you had that experience? Actually yes, I was part of starting the conservation tillage uh, initiative in, in East and Southern Africa many years back. I've had the privilege to work with uh, uh, researchers and farmers in, in action research in, uh, in Latin America where you see you know really exciting scaling scaling technologies being adopted for example on, on manure uh, manure and, um, and green uh, basically totally zero tillage green manure type systems where you're building organic matter and, and, and managing weeds by having permanent different forms of, uh, of, of green manuring crops that cover the soil. And in Africa, we have, for example, in Tanzania, uh, when I was working there in, in Arusha, an enormous skepticism when we were suggesting that you now is the time to consider throwing away the plow and simply 
instead adopting what we call rippers and, and subsoilers that simply just open the soil and where you can have precision farming. But you know, it didn't take us long, particularly working with female farmers, where they realized that they could make money out of this because if you instead of plowing the whole field where farmers then normally go and, and widespread throwing out fertilizers with, that are extremely expensive, instead just open the soil for the planting and have precision application of your precious, precious nitrogen and phosphorus, that enabled, um, you know, instead of basically fertilizing even the weeds, you could focus in a way that in the end enabled yields to improve and incomes in households to rise. And today you see that conservation tillage systems, building organic carbon, but also uh, using really, really finite resources of fertilizers much, much more carefully is, um, is, a, is a kind of a mainstream practice. Now we need this to become a revolution at a really large scale, but, but you see, um, you know, this is no longer just pilots. That's what we showed in this research article. We're starting to see a spread across the world. And the interesting thing is, it's not about reducing your productivity, it's about sustainable intensification. It's about wise management of water, land, soils and nutrients to be able to produce more food and better food without doing it at the expense of the climate system and of natural ecosystems. I wish we had more time, Johan, uh, but uh, we're going to have to wrap up this interview. I, I would just like to close where I began, uh, began by saying thank you for the extraordinary work you're doing. And next month, I know you're Launch, launching a new Lancet Commission. We've talked about the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate, and you're launching one focused on quantitative targets for the food system. Everyone wishes you luck with this new initiative. Keep up your fantastic work, and thank you so much for joining us for this 24 Hours of Reality initiative.